Too many who know the angles Uncover and untangle All the questions and the webs left out to tangle I'll be in 1962 Last Wednesday's afternoon They'll bend your ears with reckless self-abandoned The amazing spider talk The amazing spider talk Come swing through the air Sit back and prepare For the amazing spider Hello, I'm Dapper Dan Gavostin, and I'm the founder and editor of AmazingSpiderTalk.com, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals. And anyone who tells you otherwise is a crazy loon, especially if their name rhymes with Clark. Thanks for joining me for a special episode of the all-new Amazing Spider-Talk. I hope you enjoy this podcast and that it provides an intelligent conversation between two fans and collectors as we look at the Spider-Man comic universe in a bit of a bigger picture. If you want to learn everything I know about Spidey, why not subscribe to the show starting back with the first season? You can enjoy the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or your podcast player of choice. I'd love to have you along for the journey through Spidey's past, present, and future. Just head on over to AmazingSpiderTalk.com for all the details about where to subscribe. With the holiday season rapidly approaching, I thought it'd be fun to talk to some creators who've released some books all about the world of Spider-Man that would make for great gifts, whether for yourself or your loved ones. Last week, we talked with Matt Singer about his book, Marvel's Spider-Man, From Amazing to Spectacular, The Definitive Comic Art Collection. But today, I'm sitting down with one of our show's oldest friends. That's right, I'm going to be talking to Spider-Man comics editor extraordinaire, Danny Fingeroth, about his new biography, A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee. I was lucky enough to see Danny talk at the famous Skirball Center here in Los Angeles, and I was able to pick up a copy of the book. I knew immediately that I had to find a way to talk to him again and spread the good word about his amazing work. I hope you consider checking out his book, A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, and that you enjoy our conversation. Well, now let's meet one of our amazing spider friends, the kind of guy I don't see other friends who recommend. Find out about the things they created. You'll love them so much that you wish you dated. But you're just friends. They're an amazing friend. A friend, a friend, a friend. They're an amazing friend. Well, welcome back, listeners. I'm really excited to have Danny Fingeroth back on the show six years later. Danny, welcome back to Amazing Spider Talk. Great to be here. Has it really been six years? It has. You were actually our fifth guest ever on the show. Did we do that one at that convention in Connecticut? We did, yeah, back when it was called Kineticon. It is great to be back, and I can't believe time has flown like that, but here we are. So you're here today to talk about your new book, A Marvelous Life. I'm nearly done reading it, and I'm loving every page of it. It's a biography of Stan Lee, and I thought, what better way to get started with this interview than maybe to have you do a reading from it? Does that sound good? Uh, That sounds good. And the full title is A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee. And it's from St. Martin's Press slash Macmillan. But yes, I will read a chapter. This is from chapter 11, which is titled Boom, 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 or Boom, Boom, Boom. Baby boomer navel gazing is beyond a cliche. And yet there seems to be no better way to explain Marvel's popularity and Stan Lee's 60s celebrity than as a factor of boomer culture. A significant number of kids who are hooked by Marvel from early Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and the rest grew from childhood to adolescence or from adolescence to adulthood during the period from 1961 to the late 60s and maintained an interest in Marvel's characters and creators over those years. Of course, most adolescents drop comics, but a fair number now did stay with them, including college students. As Kirby was bursting boundaries of concepts and vision, Lee was doing the same with writing, editing, and promotion. Certainly the fact that both men had boomer children could well have been a factor in what they were thinking and storytelling about. They had literal skin in the game. The world in which their children were growing up was knocking constantly at their doors. 
Sex, drugs, and rock and roll wasn't just a glib slogan to them. They were realities that their kids faced daily at school and on the streets, and for that matter, on TV and in the movies. It was what everybody's kids faced. There were 70 million boomers in a country of around 200 million. And while Steve Ditko was neither a boomer nor a father of one, he did seem to have never lost touch with the Johnstown High School teenager he had been or with the timeless verities of adolescence. So the audience that had been in grade school in the early mid-60s was now heading for college or Vietnam or the Peace Corps or Canada or Haight-Ashbury or a factory or an office. And many members of that audience kept up with Marvel's comics. And many of them wanted to know what Stan Lee thought about what was going on in the world. Why? Largely because Lee had happened upon a personal connection with Marvel's readers, and Lee was synonymous with Marvel. Stan Lee, an actual person with a voluble public persona, was the voice and face of Marvel in a time when corporate mascots Superman and Batman were the voice and face of DC, and no one was really the voice and face of any other comics company. So it didn't really matter to most readers what DC editors Julius Schwartz or Bob Kaniger or Mort Weisinger thought about the issues of the day. Those men, whatever their real-life personalities, didn't think of themselves as publicists or cheerleaders or spokespersons. Their job was to put out entertaining comic books that sold well enough for them to keep on putting out entertaining comic books that sold well enough. Stan Lee had decided that his job description was something else. A child of the Great Depression and of the peregrinations of the comics business, he seemed to instinctively realize that his desperation move to provide Marvel with a friendly face also gave him a launching pad for becoming a celebrity who surprisingly, probably even to himself, had opinions and feelings and passions. Passions that related both directly and tangentially to a medium and a company that he thought he had long ago ceased caring about. Lee took to this new celebrity like the proverbial duck to water. He developed a new look that involved fashionable suits, a neatly trimmed beard, and a stylish, well-sculpted toupee. It had become clear that so long as Marvel was prominent, he would be prominent. And if Marvel ever lost its cachet, or if it decided it didn't need Stan Lee anymore, he was now in a position to take his celebrity and do with it whatever he felt necessary and appropriate. Sure, he was in the comics business, but he was now also in the larger entertainment business. Most importantly, he was in the Stan Lee business, and that, it would turn out, would be a very interesting business. It was a business that would be key to pretty much everything professionally, and often personally, that would happen to him for the rest of his life. If there was ever someone in the right place at the right time, with the right skill set, experience, and personality to make the most of the possibilities presented to him and created by him, it was Stan Lee. So, Danny, this book, A Marvelous Life, is a huge biographical undertaking. Can you tell our listeners first, what should they expect when they buy this book? What they should expect is a serious biography. When I say that, I don't mean it's somber. It's not. It's, uh, I tried to keep the tone you know, reasonably upbeat. It's not a coffee table book. It's kind of a biography, like when you go to the biography section in the bookstore or the library and you're thinking, gee, I'd like to know more about Abraham Lincoln. It's a biography of Stan, and of course, when you write a biography of somebody, you're writing about their life and times and the people they knew, the people they loved, the loved them, that they hated, that hated them, the work they did, the historical context. It deals in his relationship with his collaborators, especially uh, Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, it deals with his family life growing up in New York and, and the different people and historical and cultural forces that shaped him. When I first thought about the book, I thought, well, most people probably want to know about Stan starting in 61 to 70, sort of those prime Marvel years, and maybe something about the Hollywood years and something about the weird stuff that went on at the end of his life. Uh, and I won't have to talk too much about the first 40 years of his life, you know, his, from birth to getting the job at Marvel at age seven, a timely, which is, became Marvel at age 17, and then the 20 years when he was the editor-in-chief of one of the largest comic book producing companies in the country. But it turns out 
you can't really, A, you can't really understand what he did and how significant it was in the 60s and on without understanding and knowing about his early life. Plus, a lot of the stuff that he did and that happened to him was really interesting. You know, one of the most interesting things about Stan is that how instrumental and how ubiquitous he is in the history of American comics starting from the time he entered the business, which was 1940. So two, so Stanley enters the business as a teenager two years after the debut of Superman in Action Comics. So he's there for everything, you know, whether doing it at, at Timely, Atlas, Marvel, that which they interchange those names over the years, or kind of competing with the people at DC, or, you know, what was on the radio, what was in the movies, and, and how Stan took cues from that. This thing called World War II happened in the middle that it was in all the papers. Maybe you read about it. I mean, it was... If any of you know what I've written before, Superman on the Couch, Disguised as Clark Kent, The Rough Guide to Graphic Novels, and all, of course, all my comic book work, you know, for the decades at, at Marvel, you know that I'm very interested in the history of the industry and, and the stories of the people who created it. And so Stan is in some ways very typical of his generation, you know, that New York, Jewish-born, Depression-era kid who comes to work in comics and, you know, and, and before too long is out-earning his father, you know, which is the story of a lot of those people. And so, of course, so in a way, it's typical. In many ways, it's totally untypical. He's a writer, an editor, an art director who happens to be a distant relative of the owner of the company, which was more common in in comics and publishing than than people may know. But then suddenly his life takes a whole different course, and he becomes Stan Lee, and, and, and he becomes this whole, this very unique figure who everyone still somehow know who this guy is. You know, so it's, I thought, I, I thought that whole, that, that's what the book deals with. You know, I think it will, I tried to write it so that there was enough detail for people who did know their comics history and were fans with either with a small or a big F. But I wanted it also be to be an exciting and interesting biography for people who don't know a lot about Stan and, and for whom the controversy controversies surrounding him, you know, were not familiar. I structured it so that it would have a st- like like a story. So it would be a literal page turner and you want to know what happens next, you know. And I hope I succeeded at that. Well, that's what I wanted to emphasize, you know, to my audience and to kind of, I think you did a good job of summing it up is that like, this is not a thesis work. It's not a dry retelling of it. It's, it's both serious and factual, but also written by someone that clearly knows this era very well and this person well, and can kind of cut through it and get to the heart of it. And that's what I really enjoyed about it so far is like just how, it's both serious and friendly in a way. Well, thank you. That was that was really my intention. And it's also, I mean, I know you just said it's not an academic work, and it's not, but it does have over 300 endnotes. There's so much controversy around Stan. There are so many stories and myths and, and counter stories. And, you know, I, I, I thought it was important for me to show as much as I could. You know, I did like 50 interviews for the book, you know, with Stan himself, I did two lengthy interviews with Roy Thomas, Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill, Jerry Robinson, Flo Steinberg, dozens and dozens of people. You know, I wanted to make it uh, clear that I wasn't just pulling stuff out of thin air. And and if something came with a specific point of view, I wanted it to be clear whether it was my point of view or the point of view of somebody I interviewed or of Stan himself. I think it's important for a biography because really otherwise... Uh, you just don't know how trustworthy the material in a in a book is, and I re- and I wanted and, and I've and I've had that happen to me. So I tried to do both things. I tried to make it credible, and yet also have it read almost like a novel. Well, like you said, the book does an excellent job of recounting Stan's early years as a writer, a publisher, and also as someone serving the country. What's What's curious to me is that, and you've mentioned this, as you write the book, you often tell at least two versions of every story. There's like the way that it's been mythologized and then what your evidence has led you to believe actually happened to the best that you can find. What has it been like writing a biography for someone who is so mythologized and self-mythologized and how did that change your process? Well, I will say that 
I had good preparation. Once you've started researching and writing about something, it's really perfect preparation to deal with, you know, with reading all the conflicting and different theories, you know, and testimony about uh, how Marvel Comics and its characters were created. So, I mean, but so the reason I give the contrasting stories is because nobody, including even the most passionate people online, and who are absolutely certain that they know exactly (laughs) what happened, weren't in the room. Most of them weren't even born when these things happened. So I felt because I wanted to give a... Well, it's too glib to say warts and all, but I wanted you know, I wanted to show the dimension of Stan and kind of the the ambiguity of creativity and how challenging it is to write about things that 60 years ago, when you know, when when these guys were either you know discussing the stories or working on them separately in their various studios or homes, or, the last thing they thought is anybody in the year 2019 would be discussing who created (laughs) Ant-Man or who created, you know, you know, I mean, I have that quote from Stan when he wrote a letter to a guy named Jerry Bales, who was an early comics historian about Dr. Strange. And he says, and he says, "'Twas Steve's idea. And I write in the book, it's very ambiguous. What does that mean, Steve's idea? And this guy said to me, it's not ambiguous. It's a, it's a clear, exactly. It was Steve's idea to which I said, What does that mean, that it was Steve's idea? (laughs) Right, which which version of that sentence that precluded it is the idea he's referring to? Right, is it the origin, which was very much like the origin of uh, Dr. Droom, which had been like six months before it appeared in Marvel? Is it the origin? Was it the backstory? Was it the literal story in the comic itself? Was Was it the idea of having him a... Even quoting a sentence like that and sort of examining it is controversial because it's Stanley, you know, and Steve Ditko, and 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 you know, and or Jack Kirby in what in a different case. I felt I wanted to give these different points of view. I th- I think my ultimate point was there is a certain mystery to it. I think that without Stan, Jack, Steve, and 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 Martin Goodman and and Larry Lieber, but th- without those five or four, you know, people. There is no Marvel Comics. You know, I think they're all irreplaceable. I mean, you can say Steve only was involved in in the creation of two major characters, although he did redesign Iron Man's costume to be the one that we think of now. You know, so maybe Steve didn't wasn't involved in the creation of as many characters as uh, Jack was, but Spider-Man, you know, is, is maybe you know is Marvel's flagship character, and maybe they're they're you know they're 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 most well known and and popular. So you you know I think sort of you know even though he didn't have the same number of characters as Jack, he certainly had a great influence. So people will damn Stan with Stan with faint praise. They'll say, well, Jack and Steve did all the work, but Stan was a great editor and promoter. But he and it's like eh, no, Stan was a great editor and promoter, and he was involved in in creating those characters. How much was it? Ten percent, twenty percent, sixty percent? I don't, you know, I mean, that's so that's sort of why I gave the different points of view and the, and the different stories that sometimes the least dependable evidence is eyewitness evidence because people's memories vary greatly, you know, and, and everybody's the hero of their own story and people's stories change. I mean, I sort of note that too, how Stan, you know, how Stan's narrative of how the characters were created varied over time, as did, as did certainly... Jack, I think Steve was a little more consistent, but even, you know, I, I, I didn't go through with that fine tooth of comb. Because people say, oh, he just dialogued them. Well, you know what? You know those characters because of the way they speak and the way they think and the way they interacted, you know, and, and, and in comics, the dialogue very often directs the story. That was some of the conflict between Stan and his co-creators, too. They would think they were writing, you know, or plotting one story, and Stan would swoop in and make it a different story. You know, all these different factors were involved. So I just thought, let me give various stories, various points of view. There's the creative process, and it sounds very kind of highfalutin and the philosophical. Then, of course, there's the money and credit thing. I think Stan more often than not gave credit to his collaborators, which very often say the reporter he'd be talking to would leave out because they thought it was too complicated for their audience. 
you often hear, well, Stan stole money from Jack and Steve because oh, the they, they didn't get the writing credit. Well, you know what? At Marvel and at every company, there was no plotting pay. You know, there was no such thing. It wasn't like, oh, Stan took that rate. There was no, you know, there was the way things were structured. It wasn't until like the, like, like 1980 or beyond when the idea that somebody would get paid a third or a half for plotting. But I mean, I think if Stan got a pay raise for the artists, very often I think that pay raise was based at least in part on the fact that they were plotting. You know, we are talking about an era when the total payment for a page of script was 10 or $15. You know, so if Stan got a pay raise of whatever, 5 or $7 for a penciler, I think that very often took into account that they were uh, plotting or co-plotting. And I think, and again, I think that whole method of working changed with every, every issue. I don't think he and Kirby worked the same on two issues in a row. I think it was different, you know, again, whatever it took to get the comic out. It's the nature of the game, and I just think they were all irreplaceable. You know, the stuff about credit and money is is tough. Stan, as were Jack and Steve, was looking out for Stan, and his, you know, Stan was looking out for himself and his family, just like Jack and Steve were. One of the uh, most illustrative stories that you tell in the book is of a young Stan Lee painting his name on the ceiling of his <laughs> high school. It really, pardon the pun, paints an amazing portrait of the man, even at a young age. And his specific brand of humor and, I guess, self-mythologizing. Can I mean, listeners haven't read your book, I don't think. So can you tell them about this story? Because I just thought it was so charming and also like, wow, that is Stan Lee. Well, I mean, it's a pretty well-known story. Because one, one thing I think I was able to do in the book in general, and that I finally learned how to do with Stan by the time I was interviewing him for the book, was to kind of get around some of his you know, million times told stories and dig a little deeper or come at them from a different angle. I mean, I think that's my strength as an interviewer in general, if anybody's, you know, remembers Right Now magazine and other interviews I've done, uh, many with people at their different conventions. And you know, I try to come at things from a little, little different point of view to get people off of their million time told story. So Stan has often told this story. He was on the uh, staff of his high school magazine, not the newspapers. Uh, a maga the Wick Clinton High School had a magazine called The Magpie. And Stan was, I think, the publicist or the publicity director for the magazine. The editor may have been Patty Chayefsky, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I know Chayefsky was the editor. Not sure if he did it when Stan was on it, but Chayefsky went on to be the writer of a Mar the screenplay of Marty and of Hospital, one of the most famous playwrights. And you, you note that ever. like his high school was full of people that would go on to become big names. Oh, yeah, I just named a few of them. If, if, if you take a look at the DeWitt Clinton High School alumni page or the Wikipedia page, it's kind of mind-blowing who went there, you know. They're working in this building called the Tower, which I guess was a tower. DeWitt, if you've seen DeWitt Clinton High School, it still, it still exists. It, it's, it's kind of looks kind of like Dr. Doom's castle almost, you know, it's, it's, but it's very large. The school at its peak had 12,000 students, all boys, it's an all boys school in, in, in the, uh, in the Bronx. And so the, they were painting, painters were working on, on the, on the room and Stan took uh, a paintbrush and climbed up on the ladder and wrote on the ceiling, uh, what he used to always say was Stan Lee is God, which is very funny, you know, it sort of shows you early on that he was not exactly a, a wallflower or shine retiring. But I, I said to him, so you were calling yourself Stan Lee when you were in high school? I thought that it didn't start till, till you started uh, your job yet timely. And he said, you know, you're right. I, must have, I, I didn't call myself Stan Lee till timely. I must have written Stan Lieber as God. Again, maybe not the most earth-shattering revelation, but I thought it was interesting to kind of get a little deeper into that story that he told many times and yet get him to think about what he actually wrote there and you know who knows maybe somewhere under like you know 10 layers of paint it's still there <laughs> i would i would imagine once the painters came back they probably painted it over you know? someone is up there with uh some like rough paper trying to get the layers off get this answer to this question <laughs> Somebody there with a laser or a spectrometer or something, you know. Right. Bring in the guys who redo the Mona Lisa and we'll figure it out. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. Your book creates this image of a man who is kind of working nonstop in the industry, doing everything he could to like break in or as he often says, like, you know, write the great American novel, you know, short of actually writing the great American <laughs> novel. You know, and I think a lot of criticism of Stan Lee seems to kind of cast him as a guy that kind of was in the right place at the right time to take advantage of others. But really, he seems like he was just doing everything all the time. And I, and you knew him personally. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting to know him better by reading your book. But like one of the things that I always think about is how did this guy maintain this level of energy? I mean, he was 95, which suggests, you know, a lot of energy to, to live that long. What do you what is your understanding of like how Stan kind of like fueled himself? I think he figured out because so you're right. He was energetic and he's always energetic and very bombastic. I mean, I think there was a thin, I think there's a little current of depression running through there too. You know, just you can sort of tell by the characters he wrote. Anybody who was his friend or even colleague at the time, they report, you know, they describe him as a very energetic, funny, he loved to make people laugh. Anything for a laugh guy, including pratfalls and wearing like a beanie, you know, with a propeller on his head and playing the ocarina. But yeah, somebody with endless energy, just you know, to go, you know, horseback riding in Central Park. And so I think that personality was there, but only seen by his friends and colleagues and family. Right. I think that kind of that, that outgoing comedian, ham bone, punster, commentator on life, I think he was there. And then so, I think the light bulb moment for him really was, was to lend some of that to his characters, to the way they spoke and the way they reacted to things. And I think to then make, to develop a public version of that character simply because Marvel at that point had kind of imploded in the late 50s and they, he was all they had. They didn't have a publicity department. They didn't have a public relations department. They didn't have an advertising department. They had Stan. And somehow he figured out, and I don't know if it was a single moment or, but somehow he figured out that he could take a version of his real persona and amplify it and make that the face of, uh, and voice of Marvel. You know, I think that, as much as anything... And I think also make it the voice of the characters. I think somehow deciding, you know, there's that story that that he tells and, you know, that Joan said to him, you know, when Goodman uh, said, we need some superheroes and, you know, and Stan came home and said, boy, I don't want to do the same old cliche superheroes. And Joan said, well, why don't you do comics the way you want? What's the worst that can do? Fire you. I think that's a part. I think that story happened and didn't happen. I mean, they both knew that Martin wasn't mm. going to fire him because he was related. And the company was doing pretty well. And they were putting out 12 comics a month. So for various reasons, they had to cancel. I think they canceled maybe one of their romance comics to make room for the FF. I always, I, you know, I have a feeling that was a conversation he and Joan probably had a thousand times. Every time he'd come home and go, I can't stand it anymore. Martin did this thing that really annoyed me. And, and I'm sick of writing just stupid kids' comics. You know, I'm sure it's a conversation they had a hundred times, you know, but I sort of believe it, you know, and, but it makes a better story to say it was one time that he came home and she said, why don't you blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think especially once he started getting invited to colleges, you know, you, I have one anecdote in there from, you know, there was a woman who was on the committee that invited him for his first college appearance. And I think he sort of, you know, almost didn't know why would they want me to come speak at a college, you know, but... But once he realized, oh, that we have a college audience, which he'd been trying to cultivate, you know, he he knew, you know, so it's like, oh, we've been successful cultivating this older, the somewhat older audience besides the regular, you know, little kids who read comics. Somehow that, that I think is almost the, you know, the big bang moment where we got, where he just figured out, I'll be that person to the public. Because, I mean, seeing him in private he wasn't that different than the public guy, just quieter, you know, not as not as loud and amplified. But there wasn't that big a difference between the private Stanley and the public Stanley. Every time I talk to someone who knows Stanley or I see a Q&A with someone, even your Q&A, it almost inevitably comes up from the audience where people ask, was he really like that? You know, like uh, it, it, it seems people have such a hard time, under, you know, believing even that. Could someone really be that energetic and nice? 
Well, like I said, I think a little more low key, but you know, energetic. I mean, depending again, depending on the context. If it was sure. a group of people at his house for dinner, then he'd sort of put on a show. If he was, if he was just sitting with you and his wife and uh, your, your, you know, your wife or girlfriend or you know, then he'd be he'd be more quiet and maybe a little more introspective. You know, I didn't I didn't know him super well. I had many very nice times with him and a few meals and a lot of working, collaborating on projects in sort of a professional way. So I'm by no means claiming I was his best friend and I have like the inside scoop on everything that ever happened to him in his life. But I had, I think I had enough of a time with him off stage as well as on stage and, you know, just working on projects and in a sort of informal way to have some sense of who he was. So no, he would not, he would certainly not, you know, put down his fork and knife and go, Excelsior, that was a great meal. But, you know, he, <laughs> you know, so he, so I'm saying it was a quieter, less bombastic version. But what I, what I always find fascinating and have found, okay, you would go to an event, you know, a convention and Stan would be on, either on his own or on a panel. And a lot of what he'd say would be kind of boilerplate. It would be promoting whatever sure. he was working on. It would be a story he told a lot of times. But I've never seen a panel with him where somewhere in there, some incredibly frank and honest and revealing moment happens where he says something that's very personal or very reflective or very wistful. And the thing is, he says it in the same tone of voice where he's trying to sell you something. So you really have to be listening for it. And I've heard and listened to and been, you know, privy to so many of those events that I that my antenna are pretty good. But you know, you if you if you know if your listeners go to like any random Stanley YouTube video, he'll say something you go, That's really unusual for someone with that public a persona, you know, and who's so enmeshed in this big corporate media giant that's a pretty frank honest and direct thing for him to say it's re- it's fascinating you know that that there was a part of him that was really compelled to tell the truth or to give a point of view that you that you that you wouldn't expect someone in the public eye like that to do it was a very interesting part of his personality one of the other elements of his you know persona i guess is his decision making process and and the way your book really presents it and i think anybody just kind of looking at what he was putting out in the 60s and 70s is that he kind of seemed to have some kind of preternatural ability to make great decisions no matter the situation he found himself in and you know a lot of that probably has to do with a certain level of privilege that he had working for his family you know et cetera et cetera et cetera but what kind of understanding have you gleaned from doing this biography about how Stan's decision-making process works? Yes, Stan was uh, wealthy. He lived a very nice lifestyle. However, he did not own any of those characters or any of the company, unless you know, unless he counts stock options he got. You know, which, but I mean, Stanley owned no more of Spider-Man than you or I do, or of any of the other characters. You know that. I think people are shocked when they hear that. They can't believe that someone that identified with that company, those characters, after so many years, you know, and, and who was, you know, famous for having, you know, all these lawyers, did not own any of that stuff, but he didn't, you know. You know, having been in, in I, I was obviously never, you know, in as lofty a position as he was in, but having been an editor and a group editor of, a, of you know, the Spider-Man division at Marvel, you can't do that job without making instinctive decisions, and a lot of them quickly. And, you know, one of my favorite things Roy Thomas ever uh, ever said was, you know, because Roy had succeeded Stan as, as the editor. They didn't call it editor-in-chief, but that's, in effect, what it was, you know, just called the editor. He said that very often, there's, when you have a job like that, you have to make, a, you know, 500 decisions a day. And most of them, it's not even important what the decision is, just that that a decision is made. You know? Sure. I mean, I mean, ultimately, there may be some abstract level on whether the background color on the cover of Fantastic Four is green or blue or white. Maybe there is some subliminal way that that affects sales, but mostly what's important is getting it out of the house and onto the, you know, into the printers and onto the 
trucks and into the news thing. So, so maybe of the whatever 500 decisions you have to make in a day, three of them are crucial. But that means 497 are not. You know. So right. I think Stan trained himself as one has to in a job like that, to just, like, make a decision, 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 decision. You know, which is not to say, I mean, there's also stories of him reworking things, rewriting things for the last minute. Those are the things that were really important to him, you know. You know, again, I think part of that job is you pick and choose your battles, you pick and choose what is crucial and what you need to take extra time for, but a lot of it is just stuff that, you know, everybody remembers the great Marvel stories, the Galactus Trilogy, the Master Planner Saga. Everybody remembers the great stories. Marvel put out a lot of crappy stories. Sure. They <laughs> still know? do. They still do, right? But, I mean, even in the golden era of Marvel, you know, they would, there was a lot of stuff, you know, that was just churned out because not everything's going to be a home run. So we remember the great stuff, but... It, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that you, you that you can see was just uh, churned out at the last minute or 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 over the weekend or, and that's fine. I mean, that was part of Stan's genius, where he was able to bond the readers to the company so much, you know, that even if there was a clunker, you know, and usually the clunkers were not in a you know they weren't in the flagship titles for the most part. They'd be in the backup stories in one of the split books, you know, Tales to Astonish, Tales to Spend, whatever, you know. But he bonded the readers so to the company that we didn't insist that everything be great. You know, it was just sort of, okay, this is pretty good. It's got characters I recognize. I was able to pass time in a pleasant way, and I got, you know, maybe it's not as great. Maybe I didn't get as much for my 12 cents as I did in that month's Fantastic Four. You know, I mean, maybe the bouncing ball of doom, which was a Human Torch solo story, was not the greatest story ever written. But it was fine. It did the job. You know, it it gave me as a kid something to do, and maybe even something to measure the greater stories against. You know, and even the advertisers, you know, were very kind of literally nickel and dime companies. You know, you know they weren't getting for the most part advertising from big movie companies or 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 big snack companies. Most of the advertisements were like. Either they were house ads for Marvel's other comics, or they were set your poetry. You know, we'll set your poetry to music. My darling pet monkey. You know, those stamps in your in your attic. You know, might be worth a million dollars, or they might not. You know, <laughs> I mean, they were. <laughs> you know, so I don't think they were raking it in on advertising either. I think I think the money was made on selling a lot of these things and 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 churning out a lot of them. Your book hits this kind of great like climactic moment, maybe like a third of the way through where you introduce Spider-Man and look, I'm, I'm obviously a sucker for Spider-Man, but <laughs> what I thought was really incredible, but the way you framed this was you kind of showed how every aspect of Stan's life that you detailed before kind of culminated to create this one character. And you do this amazing thing that I've never seen before where you compare Stan and Steve Dicko's high school lives to the character <laughs> of Peter Parker. I guess, can you explain to our listeners what you helped illustrate there? I mean, I thought it was remarkable. Well, well thank you. And, and you know, I worked hard on that, so I appreciate that. Most of the comic guys of the first generation didn't go to college, you know? and 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 yet... Other members of the generation did, you know, who were equally poor. Because the easy thing to say is, well, they were from poor families and they couldn't afford to go to college and they had to support their families, all of which is true. But there are certainly, you read about and are related to, you know, people of that generation who are equally poor but somehow found a way to go to college or to medical school or, to, you know, I mean, it's not an impossibility. And Stan was clearly beyond bright enough to go to college, as were Jack and Steve. They were people for whom higher education, for them, for themselves, was not a priority. Stan briefly went to college when, as 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 many things were motivated in his life, when a girl he had a crush on went to City College, and he went to City College for like less than a semester. When they broke up, he dropped out of school. But especially if you live in New York City, City College was literally free, you know, and so... But he wanted to get into the work world. He needed to to support his family. His father was, you know, his father's employment was erratic, and his mother uh, was a housewife, and she didn't so she didn't have any really marketable skills. He had Larry, his kid brother, 
you know, who was nine years younger. So his family needed him to go to go to work, and he and he didn't love school. He, you know, he was he had an active, agile mind, but not for sitting around uh, in a, in a classroom. You know, I think I have a feeling Steve uh, had some of those similar characteristics. So, the, so for the founding generation of comics, they were really Harvard, Yale. They're Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. You know, were DeWitt Clinton High School, the High School of Music and Art, where all the mad guys went, and Glenville High School in Cleveland, which is where Siegel and Schuster went. For that generation of comic creators, what people, you know, maybe romanticize as their college years, you know, that was for them this intense period of becoming an adult and, and learning to understand the world and, you know, and how... You could take your obsessions and skills and make a living from them. You know, Stan was very active socially. Uh, on his high school yearbook page, he lists like 12 different clubs that he was a member of. And as I say in the <laughs> book, it makes sense that he would be in the Future Lawyers Club, although, of course, it's odd that as the founder and the president of the Future Lawyers Club, there's no, like the other guys in his yearbook, mention what colleges they want to go to. He doesn't have any college listed. He's spoken about how he wanted to be a lawyer and, you know, and how he founded that club. You know, there's, you know, he he was on the Magpie magazine. But then it says he's a member of the French club. And you go, really? <laughs> <laughs> Although maybe that explains his, his connection to Alain René. Maybe maybe Alain sensed that Stan was a Francophile. I don't know. But, you know, and, 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 it, and, it's got like, and he's got like a funny saying, you know, uh, jo- you know, his goal is to join the Navy and let the world see me. And his, and his nickname, of course, was Gabby, you know. Yeah, it makes so sense. So there's a lot about, even in that, you know, whatever, that hundred words or less that it is. And, but you can see who he is. And even compared to the other guys on the page, you can see, clearly nobody was heavily editing that yearbook. Because, you know, because <laughs> everybody else is very serious about their ambition and their, what college they want to go to and you know and they whatever you know whatever motto or saying they have you know and stands is just you can see it you can see it's the same guy who would go on to you know come up with the you know all those sayings and the bullpen bull and the make mine marvel and all age comics ditko's yearbook picture tells you nothing about the guy but his, but the, his photo really has a look on his face like he knows something he knows that he's good and he doesn't care what you think you know, there's no hobbies listed, even though the other guys on the page have hobbies, you know. And then it even gives his nickname uh, as Steve. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> his editor you, wasn't Stan Lee. Exactly, right. But I mean, it, it, so, I mean it almost shows their different personalities. And, you know, I mean, I wouldn't be the first person. I, I mean, I think the first one I remember saying it is Kurt Vonnegut. But sort of, if you look at high school as sort of a metaphor for life, which, you know, sort of, you know, while, of course, people do change, there are certain things that by high school, certain personality traits that many of us, for better or worse, are going to be stuck with for the rest of our lives. And then sort of to see that played out in the Peter Parker Spider-Man story, you know, I think it was sort of a, a synthesis of both of their lives. You know, I mean, I think, you know, for all his outgoingness, Stan was a reader, maybe a bookworm, you know, maybe he kept it hidden and was constantly joking and painting his name on the ceiling and, you know, and going out on dates and stuff. But, but I think he was, I think he was serious about certainly literature. And, and so I think there's part of that bookworm, Peter Parker. And I think there's part of sort of that, you know, that person who is maybe a little socially awkward. And I think Ditko brought in, I think they both brought in aspects of their, of their high school years and and you know and again Ditko was you know was co-plotting or 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 certainly at a certain point fully plotting but it was Stan who came in and put the words in which I think is part of what annoyed both Jack and Steve but because he was the editor and art director and writer and 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 relative Ditko and Kirby were you know left a lot of places and left a lot of professional relationships. I think they were geniuses in their own right. And, you know, they weren't going to take what, whatever they perceived as unfair treatment. And they did eventually walk. But I think all of them together did their their, their finest uh, work together. But the high school thing, I think, is, is key. You know, if Spider-Man, you know, Spider-Man, you know, was in the tradition of uh, Archie Andrews and, and Andy Hardy, and then later on sort of 
you know, uh, Ferris Bueller, just sort of that great tradition of high school as a metaphor for life and for how you face the challenges of life. And, 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 and you know, I think that's, that's obviously part of the appeal of Spider-Man. You know, as you might imagine, with someone who edited Spider-Man for so long and wrote a lot of Spider-Man, too, I mean, I think about this character a lot. I mean, one, one thing I did notice... Uh, sort of on, you know, reading for the thousandth time the first few issues of Spider-Man, that Peter Parker is not friendless. No, he's a pretty angry dude. He's an angry dude, and and the kids he hang out he hangs out with make fun of him, and are mean to him. But they never, but they never ostracize him. They somehow accept him as as like this weird guy in their crowd, and that's. That's different than not having friends. And I, I, that was sort of an interesting thing, uh, uh, interesting to me anyway. I mean, Liz Allen agrees to go on a date with Peter. You sure, know, they invite him to things all the time, and he's the one that blows them off. Right, right, and and yet they don't, and they and they and they don't treat him with a lot of respect. You know, they definitely make fun of him, but but they never say we're not talking to this guy or everybody avoid him. And I think that's a, I think it's a common thing. I mean, there are, you know, I think more common than being totally shut out by your peers in high school is being treated as the weirdo by your peers. You know, yeah. you know being the designated weirdo in your group, but you're still part of the group. I mean, that's, you know, anyway. So, yeah, you know, and I think Stan was able to put himself, you know, in the minds of all these characters, you know. I mean, it's funny, the one that he, that he you know, the only character that I think he ever said no one else can write this character but me is the Silver Surfer, and and yet in I think that was Stan's, uh, you know I think aspiration to almost be Shakespeare you know, whereas mm-hmm. I think in the words he you know had Peter Parker speak and Ben Grimm and even Reed Richards uh, you know uh, Nick Fury I think the voice you can't take away that those characters were co-created and were full of the personality of Kirby and Ditko but. They're incomplete without Stan, without you know, and 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 I think the words, I think the words he put in those characters sound more natural than sort of the almost enforced profundity of the surfer. You do an excellent job of walking readers through the kind of like growth of Stan's written voice in the pages of comics. Can you speak to like what stands out to you about Stan's voice on the page? Like, how would you identify Stan's stuff? You could almost take Superman's dialogue and Batman's and Green Lantern's and, and interchange it and not know. You know, the Adam spoke the same way Aquaman did. I mean, obviously, if Aquaman's talking about swimming under the ocean, then it's Aquaman. But I mean, aside from those sort of differences in their powers and, and living conditions, comic book characters, especially in, in superhero comics, they got, you know, all spoke the same. You know, every woman spoke like Lois Lane, you know, uh, although early on Lois was kind of a tough, uh, tough gal, but later on she became, you know, and so it was all interchangeable. Stan realized that these characters should be like characters in movies or in novels where every character has their own voice. You know, the thing speaks in a totally distinct way from Reed Richards, who speaks differently than Johnny Storm who speaks differently than Cyclops of the X-Men, who speaks differently than, than Professor X, who speaks differently than Jean Grey. I mean, even if what he did was have them speak like cliched characters from movies or TV or, or genre novels, that was still a step up from what comic books uh, had been. And I think he just kept refining that. Each character had their own voice, what you know, about for his he, own voice? Well, that's that's the voice you heard in the captions and in the footnotes, and the cover copy. And for people of my you know advanced age, you know people who were there for the first flush of the Marvel Age, you know um, before there was a you know a st- single standard bullpen bulletins page. You know the Fantastic Four was the first one with a letter column, then I think Spider Man, then slowly but surely every title, and for a while there, Stan would not only write, you know, individual answers, you know, responses to the letters, but even if he was hyping whatever, you know, the next issue of X-Men, he'd phrase it differently in each of the four different or five different letter columns he was writing that month. 
you know, essentially the two finger typist. He he typed really fast, and that to me, that's the voice that captivated me. You know, to Marvel Comics was that person talking to me, and it's funny because in 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 obviously in the days before computers, I think very often things might get left in that maybe. You know, somebody writing now doing the same thing would think, oh, I can phrase that better or I can make a better joke or maybe that's not appropriate. Or Then it was like, here's the deadline. Here's the guy waiting to take the comic to the printer. i got to hurry up and finish this and give it to the typesetter and have it slapped down in the production department. So I think there was a lot of raw stuff that, that came through unfiltered. But whatever it was, it, it was, it was, it was magical. So that's, you know, so all those voices... You know, all those different voices of Stan, the cover blurber, Stan, the recapper of the stories, you know, Stan, the narrator of the stories, and even those witty footnotes. You know, he'd always, like, have a different adjective, you know, um, yeah. set, it straight, set it straight Stan, smiling Stan, scintillating Stan, see you in Miami Stan, whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, he... He, he knew when he could break the fourth wall and when not. I think if there was a really serious moment in the story, he wouldn't, you know, have that kind of distracting footnote. But, but he, you know, he he really made it seem like he was your pal telling you a story, you know, and and that included in the, you know, in 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 the letter column answers. You know, my favorite is one where. You know, Stan had declared and you know made up in 1963 the idea of the Marvel Age. I think people were talking about the Golden Age of comics, and you know, so sort of his response to that was, "Well, this must be the Marvel Age." Yeah. And one one reader had written in saying, "Isn't that kind of presumptuous to say it's the Marvel Age? There are other companies." And Stan's response was, "So let them make up their own age. It's a free country, you know, which <laughs> you know, which you know is is." You know, just really funny. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Here's the genius of it. It's simultaneously self aggrandizing and self deprecating. Yeah. You know, it's a you know, let them make up their own age like I did. It's not like, you know, I mean, here's this thing I figured out to do. So I just, I did it first. So nya, 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 you know, right? I mean. <laughs> it was leveling um, with you that it was marketing towards you, but also, you know, like it was selling you something, but it you know acknowledged I'm selling you something. You know, you look at some of the DC letter. I mean, I think the things that came the closest to those is probably the EC letter columns. You know, I mean, I, I, that was a funny thing about Stan. He would often there were many things about which he would not claim he was original, but he wouldn't credit the people you'd think he would. Like, I mean, the closest comics came to doing that kind of personal point of view in the letters columns and, and, and in other promotional materials, E C comics, right, in the fifties. They they did that a lot. You know, they were very funny and, you know, that it culminated in Mad Magazine eventually. But Stan would never admit that that's where he got the idea from. He'd say, Well when I was a little kid there were these books by a writer named Leo Edwards. They were a series of kids prose books. And uh, at the end and at the end of each book, there would be letters, and he would have personal responses. That's where I got the idea from. So you see that a lot with Stan, where he will not claim he invented something, but he will not give, generally not give credit to his competitors. He'll say, sure. I got the idea from something I read when I was a kid. You know? When I was a kid, I grew up watching Stan on the Fantastic Four show in the 90s, where he would kind of introduce the show. And I became very familiarized with his very particular, uh, you know, vocal intonations and right. his Stan Lee isms. And I, I have to imagine, like, as a kid in, like, say, like the 60s, before Stan became this big celebrity, that, you know, this voice was very idiosyncratic on the page, but there wasn't linked with that famous New York accent that he had. That was such a part of it for me was the sound of Stan. So I guess I'm curious, how would you characterize his actual voice and, and how much of his success <laughs> do you attribute to the unique manner of his of his voice and just how he talked? Like, was this a put on? Was this his real voice? Like what? How much of this was something that Stan like kind of crafted in itself? Um, well, Stan, you know, I think Stan's kind of fantasy career would have been to be an actor. You know, he's often said that. I, that, I think acting was his first love. He he did a lot of amateur acting as a kid. He, he recalled for me the 
which I don't think I'd ever heard him talk about anywhere, that he he started acting when he was like 12 at the Hebrew Tabernacle of Washington Heights in, in Upper Manhattan, because there was a girl he liked who was who was there, you know, but I think he yeah. also because he really loved acting. What what do you think is special about his voice? Everybody, you know, everybody says it's a New York voice, and I and and I have to believe that. Although I, it never struck me as a particularly New York voice, but a lot of people say that. So maybe because I'm a New Yorker, I'm, I almost don't hear it in in people's voices. He has that side of him that's an actor. I don't know if he ever took any acting classes, but he had some kind of understanding. Again, I think he practiced for that in the office, you know. I think when somebody would come in and have one of those plot conferences with him or when he would, you know, have to talk to the assembled staff or to executives or at meetings, I, I think he, you know, I, I think I think this is Stan Lee or Stan Lieber is God guy. I think he admired people in his high school, including teachers who presented themselves in a humorous and, and dramatic way. He was very conscious of uh, people who would come around just selling newspapers, as you know, as kids often do in high school, they, you know, they take they take uh, sell subscriptions and they make a presentation about whatever the local paper is. In Stan's case, it was, I think, I mean, the person who impressed him was the kid selling the Times. I think he went on to sell the Herald Tribune. I don't know. I think I think that was just his outgoing personality. Uh, to be honest, the first time I heard Stan Lee on radio when I was, you know, I don't know, 10 or 11, I, re- I remember that being on the Barry Gray show, which was a local, maybe syndicated, late-night talk show. And I was very disappointed. To me, it didn't match up at all to the person that I had gotten to know in the print. To me, it just sounded like some guy, you know, who, you know, I think he got much better at it. Sure. If, over the years, as I heard him, I'd go, okay, well, this is you know, much better than that show I remember hearing. But the first time I heard his voice, it could not measure up to the person I had somehow conjured up in in, in my mind as, as, as Stan Lee. But I think he loved going to schools. You know, I've heard more than once the story where, you know, Stan would be on a rostrum somewhere and he'd have a sheaf of papers in front of him. And he'd say, well, I have this whole speech prepared, but, you know, I'm going to talk frankly with you guys. I'm going to throw away my, my notes and he would like make a big thing of throwing his papers away, <laughs> and I know, and then and then and he'd talk, and very often he would go to Q and A very quickly because he was good at responding to people's questions. But but you hear stories, and then people go to pick up his notes and see he just had a blank sheet of pa- <laughs> sheaf of papers. There were, there, were, there were there were you know there were no notes he was departing from. He had no intention of making a speech. It seems to me that that was the voice that if you went over to Stan and Jones' house for dinner, you heard that voice. You know, sure. that was the voice telling a story, you know, something that happened that day in the office, something that happened that day on the, you know, on the drive home. You know, what, you know I mean, I think he was a born storyteller. I think that voice was there. So I think maybe what I heard as a kid was maybe a guy who wasn't used to the radio microphone and wasn't used to that you know, to that way of communicating with his public. But I think he learned pretty quickly. The two are indelible to me. And and it's funny to hear you say that because I've watched his early interviews and he hasn't quite like perfected it. But like once he did, it was like the voice from the oh, page yeah. just came to life. You know, like this is the man built to embody the way that he represented himself on the page. Well, I think at a certain point, I think I think there was a period where he thought maybe he had to be like an erudite Madison Avenue kind of sophisticated guy. I think that was fine. But I think uh, at some point he gave himself permission to be a stand-up comedian. You know, and I think I think once that clicked in, this is something I'm I'm literally thinking about just now. So you're you're hearing you're hearing my thought process sure. at work. At a, at a certain point, he must have realized. Oh, people are here to see me to be entertained, and yes, they want a certain amount of factual information, but really, they want to be entertained. I think once he realized that, then I think maybe that was the the origin of of the stand that 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 you know that that then took over for the last thirty five or forty years. Well, Danny, you've been so generous with your time, and you know I could ask you questions all day, but that's why your book exists. 
and it's so <laughs> great. So why don't you tell everybody who's listening where they can follow you, whether on the internet or wherever else, and uh, where they can pick up your book. Oh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Danny Fingeroth. I'm on Twitter, at Danny Fingeroth. My website, believe it or not, is dannyfingeroth.com. Whoa. Uh, so those are the best social media ways to find me. Uh, the book is called A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee. It's published by uh, St. Martin's Press, which is the division of Macmillan. It's going into a second printing, so I believe there are copies available for anybody who wants it. It's available at comic book shop, bookstores, independent bookstores, of course, uh, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. If they should be out, I hope you will back order it. There's, of course, obviously it's available as a Kindle and all the regular digital formats. And if you have, if you are so thrilled with hearing my voice for the past hour and a half here, well, I have just finished reading the audio book, which will be out in late January. So if your idea of a good time is hearing me read the audio book, it will be out uh, late in January. Well, thank you again, Danny. This was really great to have you back on the show, and uh, I hope a bunch of you guys check out his book because it's a real blast. Thank you, Dan. Great to be here, and let's uh, do it again sooner than six years. Absolutely. Thank you again to Danny Fingeroth for joining me to talk about his new book, A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee. And thank you to you, the listener, for joining us for this conversation. Please consider checking out Danny's book. I placed a link to where to purchase the book in the episode's description for you to enjoy. Also, for our Patreon subscribers, be sure to check out our Patreon page and your podcast feed this week for a special review of Amazing Spider-Man number 36. There's no better place to join on the Patreon bandwagon than to join us for our exciting coverage of the Nick Spencer run. Remember, for just $3.99 a month, the price of a new comic, you'll get access to our exclusive new issue reviews, B-book reviews, mailbags, and more. And for $10 or more a month, you'll get access to some awesome commissioned artwork this season from Barry Kitson. Also, be sure to check out our sister show, The Untold Talks of Spider-Man. And we've got the amazing Spider Slack community for you to join. Just check out this episode's description for a link to join our Spider-Man talking community. A special thank you again to our editor, Rick Coast. Without him, there will be no show. If anyone has earned a happy new year, it's him. So Rick, where can our fine listeners at home find you on the internet? Any excellent podcasts of yours we should seek out for our long drive over the holiday season? Hey, thanks, Dan. And hi, everybody. So, for your long drive, if you do happen to have any long travel ahead of you, and safe travel, I hope, you can find my work at modernaudiodrama.com. There are a link to the podcasts there. There are plenty of audio miniseries complete and done. Shows like The Behemoth, the superhero audio drama Inhale, the fantasy Briar Lane, as well as a bunch of others. And one thing I do want to add, the annuals do not count. Sorry, Dan. Happy holidays, everybody, and be safe. Awesome. Thanks again, Rick. If you want to follow me on social media, you can check out my Twitter account, where I'm considerably less sick sounding at at SupSpiderTalk. But I'd be remiss if I didn't issue a special recommendation for my friend and co-host, Mark Giannacchio. We may not agree about the annuals, but if you're looking for another book to pick up this holiday season, why not check out his book, 100 Things Spider-Man Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. I've got a link to that book also in the show notes. It's super cheap, it helps out Mark, and it helps out the show. And it's stuff full of a ton of Spider-Man knowledge that we bring to the show each week. It means a ton to us if you check it out. But mostly, I want to be sure to remember you all that... With great podcasts, there must also come the all-new Amazing Spider Talk. Don't miss the next installment.